If not, let me ask you all to join me in a prayer of thanksgiving. A gracious, loving, giving, and eternal Heavenly Father, we bless you for the many ways you made your presence felt in each of our lives. And just as you made your promise to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the, the promise of land, the promise of seed, the promise of hope, the promise of opportunity, the promise of challenge, and the promise of reunion and celebration, you made each of those promises come in each of our lives today. We thank you for this morning and the reunion with our fellow classmates and, and students uh, of your word. We pray for the members of our class who are away from us. We pray for those who may be in some distress or some physical ailment, you know, just as you have been with all of our forebears in the past and with us today. We pray that you'll be in each of those situations. We pray for the President of the United States. We pray for each member of Congress. We pray for the members of the judiciary and all those who are in positions of responsibility and authority over us. Just as we ask for your presence in our lives, we ask for the same presence in each of those. Be with us as we study today and as we examine your word, be with us as we study your servants in the past. Pray that you forgive us our many sins. That's what you say, my man. So Steve is coming, this, this, Steve is here this morning to talk a little about Stephen. And, and so it, it came to me to ask Steve, as Fred would have asked, about the Stephen ministers, what, if, that, if that's the etymology of the Stephen ministers. So Steve Scott. Resourcing us. <laughs> uh, well, as David said, we're looking at uh, Stephen from the book of Acts today. And I would say Stephen ministers do come from Stephen in the New Testament book of Acts. So um, we, we see that um, the origin of the office of deacon uh, we get in the in the book of Acts. The apostles felt distracted and weighed down by too much responsibility for serving all the people in the but by standards was a small faith community then. So uh, by the Power of the Spirit, they were led to select deacons, and Stephen was among the first uh, seven deacons. So, so yes, bingo, David. Thank you. Uh, so, the um, our reading this morning is from uh, Acts six seven through fifteen, and uh, I'll I'll read that this time, and then we'll, we'll I want to back up to some earlier things in in Acts that. Um, uh, that are worth our recalling, and then we'll talk some more about this specific text. And the theme this time is living in faith. As you recall, each of these uh, scripture selections for the quarterly uh, is, let's see, they're from different places in the New Testament illustrating different aspects of faith. So it's not uh, consecutive since we were in uh, 2 Corinthians last week or wherever we were. Um, so the word of God continued to spread. The number of disciples increased greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. That's an interesting point that hasn't always stood out to me. Stephen, full of grace and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and others of those from Cilicia and Asia, stood up and argued with Stephen. But they could not stand the wisdom and the spirit with which he spoke. Then they secretly instigated some men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. They stirred up the people as well as the elders and the scribes. Then they suddenly confronted him, seized him, and brought him before the council. They set up false witnesses who said, this man never stopped saying things against his holy place and the law. For we heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs that Moses handed on to us. And all who sat in the council looked intently at him, and they saw his face was like the face of an angel. And then Acts continues into Stephen's speech, his sermon, his testimony before the council, which goes over a great deal of biblical history up until that time, and then they've heard so much they stop their ears and take him out to stone him to death. 
But let's back up a bit in ACTS to see some of the highlights. To remind you briefly, um, ACTS is the second part of a two-part work, Luke Acts, by the same author. Uh, so in a way, it is a continuation of the gospel. Uh, the gospel of Luke ends with the ascension of Jesus. Uh, the book of Acts begins with the ascension of Jesus, told each in a uh, slightly different way. Um, but then... Uh, we get the story of the early church down to Paul's arrival in Rome. So it's a, it covers a period of some years. Uh, some people describing the book of Acts say that it, the book invokes the, invokes the Holy Spirit so often that some say we ought to call it the Acts of the Holy Spirit, but the longer title is the Acts of Apostles, or uh, the Greek title is actually Acts of Apostles. Um, but some of the things to remember, um, the like Luke, Acts is written, as I said, by the same author. So that means it's written in some of the some of the uh, best Greek in um, in the New Testament. There's uh, more educated, uh, more rhetorical style. The comparison, the contrast might be the two books that are said to be written in the worst Greek in the Bible are the Gospel of Mark and the Book of Revelation, written by people uh, for whom Greek was not the primary language. Um, so it might, we might imagine an immigrant writing a book in English and what that might sound like. And then as I read Mark sometimes, and you read it in the King James, a more literal translation, almost every sentence starts with and, and I, I point out sometimes that Sometimes that Mark's favorite word seems to be immediately because he uses that more than any other writer in, in the Bible. Um, but, I, but I think of Mark sometimes as being sort of the way a 12-year-old boy will tell the story of a movie, wanting to make sure uh, you, his parent or grandparent, uh, hears everything that happened in the movie, but connecting every sentence with Anne so you can't get a word in edgewise. Luke takes a different point of view. It's um, there's a more elegant style, uh, better educated in Greek, and that continues um, in Acts, as I said. So, so Acts starts with sort of um, oh, uh, somewhat formal and even flowery introduction. Should have put my bookmark at Acts one, not Acts six. In the first book, Theophilus. I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God and goes on that way. Um, so some, I, I thought we would, in introducing the part that is laid out for us, I, I look at some of the highlights of the, the uh, earlier parts in Acts. So maybe the most important chapter of the book of Acts, in, in my view, is Acts 2, um, the day of Pentecost and the coming of the Holy Spirit. So you recall that the, the, uh, the disciples and the believers have gathered in the upper room and the Holy Spirit comes, and there's the sound like the sound of a great wind uh, filling the house, and and they go out into the street and tar start telling the story of Jesus, and people hear them in every language spoken by those who've come from all over the Roman Empire. So it's really um, an amazing account. Uh, when I was on the pilgrimage to the Holy Land I went on a number of years ago, uh, during the, the week of prayer for Christian unity, which the churches in Jerusalem, so many different churches, make a great deal of, one of the services during the week was, was on a weeknight. We gathered in the, uh, it's called the Chinoculum. It's supposedly the site of the upper room uh, where this happened, but it's a it dates from the Middle Ages, I would say, a big Gothic room with pointed arches, and there were lots of people crowded in, sitting on the floor, and the hint of Pentecost I got was when we were invited to pray the Lord's Prayer together, each in our own language, and you hear all this murmur of voices coming up, and it was kind of an amazing experience. So uh, 
So imagine the coming of the Holy Spirit being like that. Um, Peter's sermon uh, convicts many people who come to be baptized, and the the Acts 2 ends, um, and day by day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Um, another important point is in, in Acts 3, Peter and John go to the temple and they heal um, a lame man at the gate of the temple. And as I see it, it shows clearly that Peter and John, the apostles, are continuing the ministry of Jesus because they're doing something that um, that Jesus himself uh, would have done and did do many times. But this becomes a matter of controversy, so it end, leads to their being um, arrested and um, offering testimony. Um, so then in the next chapter... Uh, after Peter and, and John have given their testimony by the by the council, there's more about what they are doing. And these verses are important, and I'll be interested if any of you have any um, views to offer on this. Now, the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. What do you think? We don't do that anymore, do we? Um, there are ways we share. Uh, we contribute as we can, and as we feel moved, we realize that um, an injunction is laid upon us to give generously, sacrificially. Yes. It makes me think of communities that have tried to emulate this, the Cornelia Farms, isn't that one? They all just pulled everything and um and then it also makes me think of the 60s when you know there was sort of the uh movement among hippies and groups of like, communes communes right. right and they it is very yet tried to mm -hmm. sort of emulate that and and have everybody share everything right I'm struck by that, and they're all of one mind and one heart, and there's no disagreement. And there's, you know, that is really remarkable. It is, and and we've seen already in some of the texts we've looked at this month that conflict came up fairly early in the, in, in the church. In fact, in the verses that led to the deacons being appointed, there is some conflict that leads to that. So. I guess the question that occurs to me, is this really something that the church achieved for a brief time? Or remember, this is written, oh, a couple of generations later. If Luke was written around 80, Acts might have been written as late as 90, somewhere in that period. So a couple of generations after the time when this is set. So is it... Oh, back when when my grandparents were in church, it was so much better. And, and everybody always came on Sunday and stuff like that that we're used to to, uh, to hearing one way or the other. Um, was it ever really that way? Or is it an ideal that they set up to recall Luke writing or based on whatever he had heard. Uh, was, was it ever fulfilled or was it just departed from early? Some people read this and, and understand this as an injunction still laid upon the church and, and to the degree that's not what we do. They see, see that as failure, I might say, especially some of the liberation theologians. Um, there's a book by a liberation theologian, Jose Porfirio Miranda, called Communism in the Bible, and he, he 
chooses this as sort of a golden text for uh, to illustrate that and that that's how Christians most ought to live. But we can think of all sorts of ways that it's easier for us to think of ways it wouldn't work than of ways we could make it work. So, um, but, but that was pointed to as an ideal in these days. Um, in chapter five, we get into some of the persecution they begin to experience as, um, um, again, some of them are arrested, uh, uh, Peter and, um, and, so they're having a debate in, in the council. The high priest questioned them, saying, we gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, yet you filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you were determined to bring this man's blood on us. And Peter says, we must obey God rather than human authority. Where have we heard that otherwise? And uh, a time closer to our own. Um, but then th this is important, too, I think, uh, from the Council of Gamaliel is occasionally referred to. Uh, he was a um, uh, respected Jewish leader then, and he certainly attested otherwise in the in the um, Talmud and the Mishnah. So, so this is could well be historic. But he's, he said to the council, fellow Israelites, consider carefully what you propose to do to, to these men. For some time ago, Thutis rose up claiming to be somebody and a number of men, about 400, joined him, but he was killed and all who followed him were dispersed and disappeared. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up at the time of the census and got people to follow him. He also perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone, because if this plan or this undertaking is of human origin, it will fail. But if, if it is of God, you will not be able, able to overthrow them. In that case, you may even be find, found fighting against God. Uh, so, so that's um, from time to time, as the church has confronted or had to deal with some new movement from within its midst, people will resort to the Council of Gamaliel. Uh, the church has not always um, taken that to heed, but um, as we've set bounds for belief or action, but um, but that's, that's an important text and acts. Well, let's get to deacons in, in chapter 6. We get to um, the need for the office of deacon. Now, during those days, this is uh, six one, when the disciples were increasing in number, the Hellenists complained against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the dis daily distribution of food. So the Hellenists and the Hebrews might be a little confusing, but partly what, what it represents is that in the Hellenistic world, that's the world, uh, the eastern half of the Mediterranean that Alexander Great, the Great had conquered, and then they were developed, uh, divided among the um, successor kingdoms before they became part of the Roman Empire. Greek was the most widely spoken language, and there were many Greek-speaking Jews, uh, Jews for whom Greek was their first language. Paul uh, this refers to himself as coming from Tarsus in, in Asia Minor, so he would have been one of those who grew up probably with, uh, with Greek as his first language, though he certainly was a uh, devout and accomplished scholar of Jewish scripture. But So the division seems to be between uh, Greek-speaking Jews and refers to them as Hebrews, the daily speech for, for Jews in, um, in Judea and um, Roman lands there was Aramaic. The Hebrew had already become mostly a dead language as far as daily speech was concerned, though it was what they still studied for scripture. It's close to Aramaic, but it would be maybe like us studying Middle or even Old English. We, we'd be able to read it some, but not too much. So Hebrew, not everyone knew Hebrew, but but Luke uses the term the, the Hebrews. So so they they felt that some were getting 
more favorable treatment than others in the distribution of food. Remember, they're holding all things in common and they're sharing whatever they have, but but there's an issue that has developed. So the apostles say they shouldn't have to be waiting on folks that take, so they decide to appoint the, uh, the deacons and it lists the deacons. One of them is Stephen. Um, so then we come to the text for today. The word of God continued to spread The number of the disciples increased greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. So um, uh, that really sticks out to me in a way it had not before, that priests became obedient to the faith. So, uh, but, But then this controversy is stirred up by uh, Jewish opponents of um, of the early church of the apostles, and now of Stephen, one of the deacons, from the synagogue of the freedmen. The freedmen would have referred, presumably, to people who had been slaves and had become free, just as in the post-Civil War uh, Reconstruction time, we talked about the freedmen. There was a freedmen's bureau to help the former slaves in in the South. So there was a freedmen's um, synagogue, and we can imagine that maybe they were they were from such humble backgrounds. Maybe they were witting or unwitting tools for people who had uh, dastardly motives. So it was possible to stir them up against uh, Stephen or others. You mean freedmen? You call it freedmen now? Yes, freedmen who were had their own synagogue. Like Scalawags. Uh, something like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but they were. Yeah, so, um, but it it shows something about the class consciousness of that society that just as we we lose some sight of how how much it was slave and free. Paul talks about that sort of thing, but that was part of daily life. Last week, I referred to how in the Roman Empire and in the Mediterranean world, even now, there was such a patronage system, even for for people who were free, um, they would attach themselves to a better off person who would be the patron. patron. So there's the patron-client relationship. And I mentioned that uh, in in The Godfather, in the Italian um, translation, The Godfather is il Il padrone, the the patron, the patron. Excuse me, I'm having trouble saying that right today. But um, so some of that persists in the Mediterranean world, as in the uh, the kinds of bonds set up in traditional Italian society. So this was happening in that part of the world then, and so these freedmen may have been the clients of some rich patrons who would get them to do their dirty work or something like that. So. So um, so the chapter 7, then, is um, Stephen's sermon before the council, his testimony, and he, he rehearses much of biblical history down to, um, down to the time of Jesus and, and um, uh, sums it up quickly, saying that they had, the prophets had, they killed those who foretold the coming of the righteous one. He's referring to Jesus. And you have become his betrayers and murderers. You are the ones that received the law as ordained by angels, and yet you have not kept it. So, so they become, the, the council becomes enraged. Uh, they ground their teeth. But filled with the Holy Spirit, he gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he says, look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they covered their ears. With a loud shout, they all rushed together against him. I don't think they had a formal sentence, but they seemed to have had some consensus that he deserved execution. They dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he died, and Saul approved of their killing him. So 
Um, what do you hear in those verses? So uh, when, I, when I read that, it was almost that, that uh, mob spirit, that uh, domination, subordination, the, the tradition of the, of, of the law, those keeping the law and those perceived not to be keeping the law. Mm -hmm. um, power and lack of power. Right. Um, class and lack of class. I'm, I'm thinking of how, uh, yes, I agree with you. Um, I'm, I'm thinking as well of how much Jesus is present in, the, in this. First in, in Stephen's vision, looking into heaven and, and enraging them as he recalls this. Um, and then how much he sounds like Jesus. Right. And had the appearance, had the face of an angel. Right, right. So, uh... Play the sin that they're... Right. Father, forgive them. for That is really remarkable. Right. So, uh... Um, and, you know, at the time... The story is the story of Stephen, and then Luke's writing it down, passing it on as it's guidance for others who face persecution. And um, that, you know, what's the worst that can happen to me? Um, well, um, they might take me out and stone me, but I'd be received into the uh, into the arms of Jesus. So, um, uh, so he was. Uh, faithful to the end. Um, so one of the things I wonder about this is, so here in 738, we have the first mention of Saul, Saul of Tarsus, and then we have, and Saul approved their killing him. So, so the, the story of Stephen itself is beautiful. His testimony is impressive down to his last breath. But I kind of wonder in a way if the purpose of the story is to set up this introduction of Saul, whom we come to know as Paul. What do you think? And in, in that context, I'm just thinking about the, the extremes. There, there was Saul agreeing to the, the martyr. Right. Martyr Stephen. Right. Yeah, later, he uh, managed a change. Right. Right, and and um, as 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 I mentioned, this is written probably a generation after the letters of Paul, and some will say, "Well, um, Luke has important stuff to tell us, but it's not necessarily all historical." Since it's it, sometimes where Luke is quoting Paul as in a sermon, it sounds more like Luke than like Paul as we know him in his letters. But Paul does, in his letters, does talk about how I even persecuted the church. So he really had done uh, what the book shows him to have done. He was involved in, in acting against uh, uh, the, the early church in that way before he was one of them, one of us. I, I feel as if I, I ought to mention, too, that um, among concerns of our Jewish neighbors is some of the the negative portrayals of Jews in, in in all of the New Testament. And it's a fair criticism to say that Christians or people calling themselves Christians sometimes have seized on those texts to do evil things to Jewish neighbors. And, um, you know, st still blaming Jews for killing Jesus, things like that. Um, the and I think we have to be guarded about how we read some of these things to realize the the evil use to which some texts have been put. I will say not that we sh we shouldn't exercise that caution, but even even the time when when Luke is writing is still a time when there was sort of um, some involvement of Christians in the Jewish synagogue before they had been expelled completely in some cases. So there, there really was still some tension between, say, Jewish parents whose children might have been drawn to the way of Jesus and, and other people, just as uh, there were uh, families were divided uh, in among pagans, too, as um, some children or, 
or um, the wife and a marriage might have been drawn to to um, to the Christian faith. So, and we have kind of observed that in different ways in our own time. But 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 we have to be cautious about how we would treat Jewish neighbors based on misuse of New Testament texts. So I, that would that would not involve any of present company, but we can think of people who, who even in our time, uh, are ready to say uh, terrible things in, uh, regarding Jews based on this. We'll, we'll jump into some of the questions suggested in the study. Um, and if you have any other points, um, I, I welcome them. So on in the study book uh, on page 21, how does the church in Jerusalem then sound similar to or different from the church today? Think of the ideal situation we saw. Everyone shared everything in common. No one was in need. Think of this conflict that we have seen emerge that some people thought their widows were being treated worse than other folks' widows. It seems what we have to say that conflict is has been with us with us today and it will be with us tomorrow mm -hmm. as far as the eye can see mm -hmm. for whatever whatever desperate reasons. Right. That folks disagree with each other about. about right. Issues. Right. There was conflict told of the ordination of women. Yes. Right. Um, yeah, who gets visited more often? Um, um, Preacher didn't come to see me enough when I was in the hospital. Um, well, you can think of your own examples of, of that. Or the associate pastor came and pastor didn't come. So um, I, I'm sure you've heard lots of stories. Um, but th there are every church, every congregation has its own challenges to deal with in that regard and and some deal with challenges and naturally occurring differences of opinion better than others do. I was just thinking, my child didn't get the solo in the Christmas. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> right. Um, okay. How about the terror one saying, oh, holy night? <laughs> Never darken the door again. <laughs> okay. Well, he, he probably contributed to somebody else. <laughs> um, okay. But I'm actually thinking of the ways we try so hard, and, and as a denomination, I'm thinking of Presbyterian disaster systems in ways that we try so hard to. Um, uh, to meet those needs of that are just desperate, um, and and how different denominations work together in that way, as I found out more about it working on the Presbytery staff. But none of the money that we donate to Presbytery Disaster Assistance goes for staffing. That's paid for out of our per capita to General Assembly. So the money that goes goes to disaster assistance and there'll be one group i think the baptists are really good about getting in there and you know hitting those immediate needs and then and the methodists organize the food and the presbyterians come in with some of the infrastructure and stay there that's my understanding so there's sort of this really wonderful uh synergy and cooperation among how different denominations do this, but I think we can know that what we do is really important in that way. So I see that as a green shoot of we're trying to do, we're trying to meet those needs right. uh, and, and work together. Right. And this congregation certainly has some important yes. mission commitments that, um, uh, that make a difference in the lives of people in Nicaragua and Kenya, but also in the difference 
of the lives of people from here who get to go there and experience that. And, and someone said to me, oh, I don't to get to that. It just, it just all goes over again. And I was able to say, actually, no, we're done. Right. You know, right. not that I think it's good. You know, yeah. Thank you. Do their work. Right. Well, big items, though, in Christian, particular churches, if they all go into hurricane flood, yes, that's yes. where they really uh, hit it. But it's still organizing and communicating so you don't get into a competition that maybe one person gets uh, their house re-fixed and right. the house right. doesn't get a vote, right. Right. which is a, a lot of times what you what you hear, mm -hmm. but I, I haven't been on many of those, so I don't, I assume that that's mostly, it's it's the people that are doing the work that get their heads together and uh, and you come up with a good system. Right. Right. Well, and we, in a situation like that, as in whatever we might do locally to help people who are in need, we can't solve every problem, but but it's better to do something and to make a difference in some people's lives and to say, well, we can't fix it all, so we'll help, help no one. So um, um, one of those good, what would Jesus do time? So... Um, Another question, what do you think allowed Stephen to persevere in his faith when he was unjustly accused and attacked? How was he able to do that? That, that response would seem to be a, a, a fundamental of our own, of, of his, for our own faith, how we uh, speak truth to power mm -hmm. or speak out against an injustice or impropriety right. at, at a risk, at a huge risk of the future. Right. Um, from not immediately recent, but from, from within our memories, you know, I think some of us saw that um, the documentary. Oh, more than a year ago at the river about the Presbyterian ministers who were uh, lost calls, pulpits, and so forth because they said conciliatory words at the time of the civil rights struggle in the 60s. And, and those ministers were saying things that would sound rather innocuous by our standards today, but it was enough to enrage so many people that uh, I, I got, um, but they lost pulpits and some never served a church again, but, um, uh, but it was important to them to do what was right and to say the thing that would, um, be more like what Jesus said than what some of the, um, hateful people were saying. So, um. Uh, what did Peter say in his sermon today? The opposite. I haven't heard think, it yet. Okay. <laughs> I'll go ahead. <laughs> the opposite. We think of the opposite of faith being doubt, mm -hmm. but the opposite of faith is fear. Mm -hmm. And so, Stephen, his faith. Right. He didn't have the fear. Right. So. Right. Yeah. I, yes. And um, and I guess. What is it some of the people say? Courage doesn't mean you don't have fear, but it means you do the right thing anyway. And what was the other quote? Is it? Uh, fear that is yeah, was that Hemingway or someone who said fear that? Yeah, but 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 I but I would say that to agree with Peter, not to disagree with Peter, because it's. Uh, as we said a few weeks ago uh, uh, in one of our discussions, um, Tillich was one who made the point that doubt is not the opposite of faith. But what had, what was Tillich's line? But but it, but right. yes, yes, that doubt was an element of faith, not its opposite. So uh, yeah, thank you. We are not very far removed from the effects of that. Uh, Pan Melton, who is, lives at the Pines, was, a, I guess, a teenager when her father was pastor of the 
Bonneville Presbyterian Church, which is in Prince Edward County, Virginia, where there was a focus, you know, on Brown versus the Board of Education. And they, they wanted to close the schools, which they did. Right. And Jim Kennedy, her father, stood up in favor of the public schools and was forced out of that pulpit to leave Arnold. And I'm sure, I'm sure it had a very profound uh, negative effect on her family. Uh, her brother, who was a Christian minister, uh, later took his own life. Uh -huh. And I don't know whether well, I've never talked to him about that, too. but uh, whether well, maybe that was a residue of his childhood experience where he was uh, abused uh, verbally by other children mm -hmm. uh, in the community. Right. Uh, there's another example right there to find Peggy Evans, uh, husband John Evans, who was my dear friend from, from Davidson home. Um, was pastor in Auburn, Alabama at that time. And he was in touch with John Doar, who was Bobby Kennedy's point person in Alabama, and uh, would receive telephone calls in the middle of the night threatening his family. Uh, so that's not really ancient history. No. No, and that book we referred to in the last couple of weeks, I think, um, Resident Aliens by Will Willeman and Stanley Hauerwas, it talks about ministers not being able to expect that their families will be shielded from the stresses that go with doing the right thing. So, um, um, and I think... Well, we, we know from in any line of work, when um, people are exter experiencing stress in their own work, they can take some of that home and it does have a, uh, an impact on the family. And, and, and it is true in ministry as well. So, well, uh, the, um, the last question is, and we'll do this briefly, but I'm keeping my eye on the clock and I'm... Um, it's we we need to go shortly. Who are your models of faith and suffering? What do the stories of Stephen and Jesus entering Jerusalem on Palm Sunday teach you about perseverance? But I say we don't see many folks riding in. Um, but the Don Donkey or at Cadillac uh, with those points and with those pieces right. and with those obligations right. at the very public center. Right. Um, so I think you're the, you know, the people about who you've been speaking to, so many of them were a part of my student generation. Mm -hmm. I, had, I couldn't count on one hand. Uh, the number of my friends who lost their pastor. I believe you. Uh, Wilson Cawley, whose son is Clayton Cawley at mm -hmm. seminary. Uh, he was forced out of his church in the uh, in Natchez. You know, what? It was a congregation for sent to students. <laughs> <was> uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, his father and uh, his uncle was an executive predator in Orange Predator and found a place for him mm -hmm. uh, in a small, much smaller church. And then he went on to serve at a Providence Church, I believe it's Providence right here in, in Iredale County, and then mm -hmm. Alma Mall. Interesting. They had a very fruitful ministry. Uh, is there too many? Too many such stories. Yes. yes. And so, I haven't seen the movie, or the video at the river. It, uh, it was shown here, I think, in November a year ago. 
And I think that last word, um, um, they're going to be trying to, they're trying to find a way for it to be shown on a streaming channel, but also to make DVDs available. So that does become available. I'll make sure you or others here who would be interested know too. It, it was really quite touching. So um, one person who's prominently featured in it is John Kirkendall. So. Yeah, and he was in all the right. time John Evans right. was undergoing all this. Right. There was an elder out of the church. My dad had served in Montgomery, who was one of the leaders in the foundation of the PCA. Oh. And, and John, he was quite a pompous guy. He was secretary of the Chamber of Commerce in the state of Alabama. And John said one of his friends says it of him, of this guy, that he was the only person he ever knew who could strut sitting down. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good line. <laughs> Well, John Ward was his name. I remember in his August. Uh, well, the uh, worship is upon us, so let's close with a prayer, and we'll um, let's see. Now, uh, I'm not going to be here next week, so John suggested that we pre-record the 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 lesson, and John and I have yet to have an appointment to do that, but um, we'll we'll make. Um, arrangement for that, but you can be aware of that on Easter Sunday, so I'll miss being with you all then. So let's close with a prayer. Loving God, we thank you for the assurance of your presence in the lives of our families, in our own lives, and in the life of the church. We thank you for signs of your presence and love that we have been grateful to experience and to receive we pray for those for whom we feel particular concern at this time, especially for the Marble family. We pray for, for this congregation as we go to worship yet again, that you will be present by the power of your spirit and cause us to know that you are here. Bless us as we part. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You can see when you talk about it.